All right, so it is now 7 o'clock p.m. It is my pleasure to welcome Tali Nates, who will then start the webinar officially and introduce our speakers. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon to all our guests from around the world. As people are still coming and our team will allow them in, um, I just want to wish a very, very warm welcome to everyone uh, from around South Africa and around the world. And we are very honored to have with us Holocaust survivors and genocide survivors, colleagues, academics, teachers, members of the public, and uh, also friends from our centers in uh, South Africa, sister centers in Cape Town, in Durban, and of course, members, partners, and friends from Johannesburg. It is absolutely fantastic to start this series tonight with uh, friends, with colleagues, Professor Shirley Gilbert and Professor Jonathan Janssen, and to continue the series uh, next week, again with Professor Shirley Gilbert and Freddy Mutangua uh, from Kigali. The series that speaks about facing difficult pasts, reflecting on history in the present is very timely. Um, it is something that we always dealing with. Our center is a center of memory, education, and of course, lessons from memory uh, of the past. And what we do many times through looking at the histories, the difficult histories of genocide and of uh, mass atrocities, specifically in the 20th century, starting in uh, Namibia with the Herero and Nama uh, genocide and uh, up to Rwanda. And of course, sadly, it did not stop in 1994. Uh, mass atrocities and genocide is happening even after that, we look many times back to reflect on lessons from that past with the hope that uh, we will learn those lessons. Today, we will concentrate on memory, education, memorials, statues. Uh, we will look at museums as well and many other facets of uh, the study of memory. To help us to start this conversation, I would like to introduce to you Professor Shirley Gilbert. It is really an honor to welcome again a, a friend, a colleague that uh, will share with us her vast knowledge in this, on this topic. Shirley Gilbert is Professor of Modern Jewish History at University College London. She has previously held positions at the universities of Southampton, Cape Town, and Michigan. Professor Gilbert has written on the role of music in Nazi ghettos and camps, about German Jewish refugees, about displaced persons. That indeed was our webinar with her before. And uh, uh, how the Holocaust shaped understandings of and responses to apartheid in South Africa, and uh, actually her last book um, that came out earlier this year, Holocaust Memory and Racism in the Post-War World, uh, co-edited with uh, Dr. Avril Elba from uh, Australia, um, is on the shelves and in our resource center at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. Uh, Shirley was part of our curatorial team for the permanent exhibition of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. So it was my honor to work with her for the past uh, 10 years. And we were very proud uh, to host her in person, physically at the center a few times. It is a great honor to also uh, introduce to you Professor Jonathan Janssen that we worked with uh, for many, many years, including him being our keynote uh, speaker at the dedication of the center's opening uh, in 2015 and working with him closely when we designed uh, the uh, Facing the Past study tour of student leaders of the University of Free State when he was vice chancellor there to uh, Poland and Germany. Um, 
Professor Janssen doesn't need much introduction, so I will give a short bio to introduce uh, him to those of you that uh, did not hear him in the past. Professor Jonathan Janssen is Distinguished Professor of Education at Stellenbosch University and President of the Academy of Science of South Africa. He is a curriculum theorist and his research is a con a concerned with the politics of knowledge. His 2019-2020 books co-authored and co-edited include South African Schooling, The Enigma of in Inequality, Fault Lines, A Primer on Race, Science and Society, Who Gets In and Why, The Politics of Admission in South Africa's Elite Schools, Learning Under Lockdown, Voices of South Africa's Children, and Learning Lessons. It is an absolute pleasure to have you both first share with us some of your thoughts on the subject. First will be Professor Shirley Gilbert, followed by Professor Jonathan Janssen. Then we will have a conversation. And after that, we will ask you to enter in the chat some of your thoughts and questions, and I will facilitate the discussion uh, in the end of uh, the session. Shirley, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Tali, um, and hi everybody, uh, nice to see you, those of you who I can see, and, and lovely to see lots of familiar uh, names and also lots of new ones too. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, if I may make a quick little plug to say that in addition to representing UCL, I'm also representing the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Centre, um, which is a small charity founded just a couple of years ago in memory of the late historian Sir Martin Gilbert, um, whose aim is to bring history to wide audiences and make it accessible and exciting. So please do um, have a look at um, our What's On page on our website to see what we've been up to. So over the last few years, we've become increasingly aware, or perhaps more accurately, I should say, we've been made increasingly aware, if we weren't aware before, um, of the extent to which the past is present in our physical landscapes, in our towns and cities, in our political discourse, in our civic life, and it's become a subject of often heated public debate. I'm thinking, for example, of the Roads Must Fall movement, of Black Lives Matter, and so on. And the idea, um, that Tali and I had of running these two lectures was to dig a little bit more deeply into the larger questions underlining, underlying this increased interest in how history is represented in the public sphere, to take a step back to consider some questions that will allow us to think in a more zoomed out way about what is going on and what is at stake when history enters the public realm to the extent that it has been. Um, and our focus in these two lectures will be particularly on the dynamics and challenges of representing some of the most difficult pasts and what happens when these pasts enter into the public sphere. And the three case studies that we will weave through these two lectures are the Holocaust, apartheid, and the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. Today, as Tully said, um, I will be joined by um, Professor Jonathan Jansen, and I should say, Jonathan, that I feel totally honoured to be sharing this uh, Zoom stage with you, as it were, um, that in addition to being a brilliant academic, um, you are just such a, um, an open and generous thinker and person, and so I feel really honoured um, to be able to have this conversation with you. Um, and next week, I'll be joined by Freddie Mutangua, who is um, a survivor of the genocide in Rwanda and also the executive director of both the Aegis Trust and the Kigali Genocide Memorial. Um, and I'm really grateful to, to both of them for giving their time to be part of this conversation. So as far as um, the format of the lectures is concerned, I'm going to start today by talking very briefly about the concept of memory and memorialization in general. Uh, and then I'll go on to look at some specific examples um, I will look at some examples from the Holocaust and then I'll pass over to Jonathan, um, who will talk a little more about South Africa and then we'll, we'll come together, draw some points together. So to start with some general thoughts on memory, the first point to clarify is that the memory that we're talking about is public. This is memory that takes the form of museums, memorials, statues, commemoration ceremonies, also many perhaps less concrete forms, 
um, education, attitudes. Um, these are re representations or manifestations of the past in the public sphere um, that stimul stimulate public memory or collective memory in some way. <clears throat> um, I'm going to share with you my screen to show you um, a photograph of uh, one of the most important figures in the study of collective memory, uh, the French sociologist Maurice Halbwachs. Uh, in a book in 1925 titled The Social Frameworks of Memory, Halbwachs talked about the idea that all memory, even personal memory, is a social process that is shaped by the various groups to which we belong, family groups, religious groups, geographical groups. In other words, even our own personal memories are shaped by larger social uh, dynamics with which, within which we live. Uh, in a much later essay that was published in 1950 after his death, uh, the essay titled Historical Memory and Collective Memory, um, Halfax made a distinction between history and collective memory. Um, in, his, in his conception, history aims on the one hand for a universal objective truth, whereas collective memory, on the other hand, is much more closely related to the needs of groups in different times and places. So in other words, he's distinguishing between history as uh, perhaps the work of professional historians, something that is rigorous, that is evidence-based, that is aiming to uncover some kind of truth, as opposed to memory as an understanding of the past that is shared and enacted by the public, and that is often shaped by needs and desires that don't necessarily always align with truth and accuracy. Um, now, this is not to say that memory is willfully inaccurate. That's a very important point to emphasize, but rather to say that faithful documentation of the past is less its motivation. A much more important motivator is the question of how particular groups want or need the story of their past to be told in the present. And central to all of that is identity. By this, I mean that our sense of who we are in the present bears a very strong relationship with how we tell our history. We explain who we are, or perhaps who we want to be, who, who we imagine we are, by explaining in particular ways where we have come from. Um, now, I should emphasize that while this distinction between history and memory can be a very helpful analytical tool, and history and memory can in many ways be seen as distinct phenomena, the line between them is also often blurry. And it's not always as easy to separate them as we might think. Also, they sometimes, increasingly, I think, um, over the last few years, make claims on one another, uh, especially when a public feels particular ownership over how particular histories are narrated. And I think that's partly what we've been seeing over the past few months and years. Um, so two larger points to emphasize. The first is that the public's view of the past doesn't just come or even doesn't even mainly come from professional historians, but from a much wider variety of sources, from mass media like films, television, popular books, um, tourist sites, museums, memorials, battlegrounds, um, and a variety of social sources, families, schools, communities, religious groups. So the process of writing histories, of constructing histories is immensely complicated and involves many different people. The second point I wanna emphasize is that memory is not a neutral or automatic or inevitable process. Rather, it is formed through a very selective process of reconstructing the past, um, often shaped by present needs and interests. <clears throat> Um, so here is a quote for you um, from the American historian Michael Kamen, who wrote in his 1991 book, Mystic Chords of Memory, societies in fact reconstruct their pasts rather than faithfully record them, and they do so with the needs of contemporary culture clearly in mind, manipulating the past in order to mold the present. So when we talk about the idea that memory is constructed, what we mean is that it's selective. We don't memorialize every bit of our histories. We pick and choose what we decide to cast into stone or bronze or to put into our museums or to put into our educational curricula or to put into our history books. This is inevitable. It is neither good nor bad, but entirely unavoidable. Um, but there's lots of different factors that can play into how that past is constructed. Um, one 
one big factor can be different national or group myths and ideals. We present history in a way that associates us with particular values or triumphs or aspirations. Um, political needs at different times can also uh, feed into this. For example, sometimes we want to emphasize our heroism, perhaps downplay guilt, or sometimes perhaps atone publicly for guilt. Um, and, and there are many other factors. The larger point is that historical representations, the present of the past, the presence of the past, um, reflects not only the past itself, not only past events, but also current concerns of communities and a group or a nation's ideas about itself. <clears throat> so um, as we consider the various examples that we're going to be looking at tonight and next week, there's a series of broader questions I think that we can ask to help us make sense of what we're looking at. Who is guiding the process of remembering? We can ask ourselves, who is deciding what should and shouldn't be commemorated? What is appropriate and what is offensive? When we narrate our pasts, which events are remembered, which are forgotten? Why are some things commemorated and not others? And is it reasonable or desirable for some parts of our histories to be erased from view? Um, so those are just some big abstract uh, questions and ideas. In order to now um, explore these points a bit more concretely, I want to look at some significant examples of the Holocaust in public memory. Now, memory of the Holocaust is one of the most challenging areas of memory in the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, firstly, because it's remembered very differently by perpetrators, by victims, by others involved, um, and by now we no longer really subscribe to, to that uh, rather rigid schema of perpetrators, victims and bystanders, um, appreciating that there's much more uh, gray in between them. Um, but there are big differences in the ways in which different groups and those who have been involved in these the events and those who, who had no uh, direct involvement at all have remembered or chosen to cast that past. Um, even victims who have settled in different countries remember the past in different ways. Uh, perpetrators have in some cases uh, been reluctant to accept responsibility for the past and prefer to forget it entirely. Or in some cases, as in Germany, there are attempts to enshrine the memory of past crimes as part of a fresh new post-genocide identity. Um, Part of why uh, the Holocaust presents so many difficulties um, is that it happened over such a large geographical area and involved so many different groups of people. And the question of how to remember it, remember it um, has varied very greatly in different countries among different groups across time. And the result is that there's actually very little consensus about the meaning or the important lessons, if we want to put it in those terms of the event. Memory has been a very divided and contested affair. So I'm going to give you just a few uh, very small examples. One could, one could cite dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of others. Um, and in fact, maybe later, Tali, we can talk a little bit about how the Holocaust is represented in the Johannesburg Museum and the ways in which um, creating a Holocaust museum in South Africa brought its own questions exactly along these lines. Um, so let me share my screen again <clears throat> uh, and start to talk a little bit about um, some examples of Holocaust memorials. So the first Holocaust memorials were actually the places of destruction themselves. What you see here is the memorial at Majdanek. Majdanek was one of the six death camps established by the Nazis for the purpose of factory style mass murder, if you want to put it that way. Um, Majdanek was um, liberated in 19, 19, uh, 1944 by the Red Army. It's in the eastern part of Poland. Um, and it was turned into the first memorial of its kind. Soon after that, Auschwitz similarly uh, became a memorial. Auschwitz was uh, liberated in January 1945. Um, since then, many, many memorials and museums have been built, but especially in the last two or three decades, there has been a huge boom in Holocaust memorialization. In fact, since 2000 at least, Holocaust memory has become an international phenomenon uh, for a number of reasons. In small part, uh, because victims 
spread out all over the world all over the world um, after the war and so they brought their memories with them although uh, that probably has relatively little to do with why memory spread so quickly um, it has more to do with the enormity of events with the wide reaching Im reaching impact that they had on western society and how we think about the world um, and, and there's a big conversation to be had about how universalized and internationalized the Holocaust has become. Perhaps we can pick that up in the Q&A. Um, the point, though, is that, th that by now we have hundreds and hundreds of museums and institutions all over the world. And depending on where they were built and by whom, they remember that past in very different ways. So I'm going to look at a few brief examples from Israel and the United States. Um, but as I say, there could be many more. So starting with Israel, and I'll emphasize that here, the two examples that I'm talking about, I'm discussing in the context of the immediate post-war years, the late 1940s and early 1950s. There is a long and much larger ongoing history of how Holocaust memory figures in Israel on lots of different levels. So the state of Israel was established in 1948. Uh, three years after the end of the Holocaust, and official memory in the state was torn between, on the one hand, the need to remember, and on the other hand, the need to forget. Uh, so what do I mean by that? On the one hand, the state faced the huge task of nation building after 1948, the creation of a new, strong Jewish nation that would be able to defend itself. Um, and part of the notion, part of the self-understanding, or if you like, foundational myth of this new state was the need to move beyond the image of diaspora jury as a negative image of defenseless, passive Jews who are vul vulnerable to persecution. Um, that was something that needed to be forgotten, that, that diaspora existence. On the other hand, the Holocaust seemed to prove the Zionist argument that had been made all along that without a state and without power to defend themselves, Jews would always be vulnerable. In other words, there's the need to create a nation of strong, self-sufficient new Jews, but at the center of that identity is the defenseless victim. And this posed a real challenge when it came to how to narrate that recent past. So what is emphasized in early Israeli Holocaust commemoration in the official telling of the Holocaust past? The first thing is resistance or heroism. The official name uh, for Holocaust Memorial Day in Israel is Yom HaShoah Vahagvura, the day of Holocaust and heroism. Heroism is, is an important part of that story, even though um, the, the instances of resistance among Jews, while there were some, do not dominate the history of the Holocaust. But on the one hand, so on the one hand, there's an emphasis on resistance. There is also an emphasis on rebirth. So while some museums, some depictions focus on annihilation and neglect the millennium of Jewish life in Europe before the war, in Israel, the Holocaust was located in a much longer historical continuum that included Jewish life before and after the destruction. Why? Because Israel then becomes part of that narrative, maybe even the end point of that narrative, which goes from destruction to redemption in the land of Israel. Um, so just to give one example, this is Bet Lochamea Getaot, Ghetto Fighter's House. Um, the photo, photograph that you see is a much more contemporary one, obviously, um, but it was established in 1949. The full name of Ghetto Fighters House is the Itzhak Katzen Nelson Holocaust and Jewish Resistance Heritage Museum Documentation and Study Center. Katzen Nelson was a Hebrew and Jewish poet who participated in the first uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto, which was in January 1943, um, and he was killed in Auschwitz. So Bet Lachamer Geta as the as the title suggests, was as its name suggests, was founded by survivors, including many members of Jewish fighting organizations. And it emphasizes Jewish life before and during the Holocaust over the killing, and especially fighting and surviving the war. Um, and the end of the narrative is about Jewish life after the Holocaust to be found primarily in Israel. So again, here we see 
the, the trajectory from destruction to redemption. Um, and I'll make the caveat again here that I'm, I'm describing this very briefly. It's, it's putting it quite crudely, but just trying to sketch for you in broad brush strokes um, the broad trajectory. Um, another example is uh, the Yad Vashem Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Authority. And I'll tell you a little bit about the particular sculpture you see here in a moment. Yad Vashem was built in the early years of statehood. It was opened in 1953. And from the outset became an integral part of the state's identity. So foreign dignitaries would visit as part of their official trips. It's one of the key stops on the tourist trail. School children go there, soldiers go there as part of their army service. And the founding legislation of Yad Vashem spoke about the need to remember the dead, but at even greater length about the need to remember Jewish heroism. There's that emphasis again. One of the first things that visitors encounter is this statue that you see, which is a reproduction of Nathan Rappaport's sculpture, The Ghetto Uprising in Warsaw Ghetto Square. This was first built in Warsaw in 1948 and commemorates the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto, which is probably the best known example of resistance in the largest Jewish ghetto. The uprising was staged um, in April in 1943, by which point actually most of the ghetto population had already been deported to Treblinka and the Nazis were trying or planning to liquidate what was left of the ghetto, but they were held off by somewhere between 500 and 750 resistance fighters for about a month. This was one of the largest armed resistance, largest instances of armed resistance by victims during World War II. And that uprising became one of the most important symbols of the Holocaust in Israel and I would say elsewhere as well. In fact, it also defined the choice of a date for marking Yom HaShoah, and that's as opposed to Holocaust Memorial Day, which is the day designated by the UN and many governments as a day of commemoration. That's marked on the 27th of January, the liberation of Auschwitz. Yom HaShoah um, is uh, what Jewish communities tend to uh, commemorate, and that, that is marked on the date of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Um, Yad Vashem also reflects the state's own ideals and definition of itself um, in linking the narrative of the Holocaust and the founding of the state. So it also portrays the Holocaust in a way as the end of viable Jewish life in exile. So putting um, independ an independent state in Israel is an important part of a solution to the Jewish problem. Um, uh, the somewhat problematic terms, but I think you get my point. So again, the trajectory from um, destruction to rebirth. Um, so just to emphasize again, I've give, given a very brief and rather broad brushstrokes uh, descriptions. This was what I've um, talked about just now is the uh, original conception in Israel, some original ideas in Israel. The portrayal of the Holocaust has evolved quite far beyond um, original Zionist ideology. Um, Yad Vashem's historical exhibition, for example, has been completely revamped. Um, the narrative now includes not only Jews, but also Roma, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, homosexuals, Polish clergy, German victims of the so-called euthanasia program. In other words, it's not only um, a Jewish narrative. And of course, the Holocaust continues to feature in contemporary Israeli politics, as well as in political discourse about Israel, used to justify all manner of positions from the far left to the far right, also used to criticize the Israeli occupation. And I suppose the point I would make again is that it, the, the way in which that past is portrayed really depends on which lessons um, you wanna draw from it. So that's a couple of examples from Israel as a contrast. Um, to talk uh, a little bit about the United States. So in America, the Holocaust was not spoken about much, at least in public fora before the 1960s, but since the 1970s, it's become increasingly prominent uh, in the form of memorials and museums, in the form of education, especially university courses. There's also a great deal of scholarly work going on. Um, and in recent decades, skepticism has started to be expressed. Why does this past loom so large when it happens so far away and America had so little to do with it? Uh, the, the American historian Peter Novick uh, wrote a book called The Holocaust and Collective Memory. I can't see him, I haven't seen him. <clears throat> or as it was titled in America, The Holocaust in American Life. And he 
in trying to answer this question of why does the Holocaust loom so large in America, he discounts several reasons, including trauma. He said it's not because it's such a tra traumatic past. In fact, he argues that the prominence of the Holocaust in the public sphere has been defined by contemporary concerns at different times. So for example, he says in the 1940s and 50s, the relative silence over the Holocaust in America can be explained in part as a conscious decision by Jewish American leaders who had an integrationist agenda. In other words, they wanted to make sure that Jews could integrate uh, safely and comfortably into American life. There had been anti-Semitism in previous decades. There were real concerns and they didn't want to draw attention to themselves as a Jewish community. There was also the Cold War. West Germany was a crucial US ally. And so um, it didn't feel prudent to draw attention to Jewish crimes. Uh, to German crimes, rather. Um, in the 1960s, however, Novik says that there's a turnaround and that that turnaround also happens as the result of conscious choices among Jewish leaders. Um, particularly, he says, because of uh, internal fears about intermarriage rates, about assimilation, the Holocaust is seen as an important means for Jewish self-definition, a kind of common denominator. In other words, memory driven by identity politics. So um, what you see here is one specific example, uh, perhaps the most prominent example of Holocaust memorialization in the United States. And that's the museum that was established in the heart of the nation's capital in Washington, DC in 1993. And that's the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, I'm gonna read to you now the official justification for the memorial, which was provided by President Carter in 1979, when the initial idea uh, for the museum was beginning to take shape. Although the Holocaust took place in Europe, says Carter, the event is of fundamental significance to Americans for three reasons. First, it was American troops who liberated many of the death camps and who helped to expose the horrible truth of what had been done there. Also, the United States became a homeland for many of those who were able to survive. Secondly, however, we must share this responsibility for not being willing to acknowledge 40 years ago that this horrible event was occurring. Finally, because we are humane people, concerned with the human rights of all peoples, we feel compelled to study the systematic destruction of the Jews so that we may seek to learn how to prevent such enormities from occurring in the future. So he identifies here three significant motivations for Holocaust memorialization in the United States. First, the United States is presented as a rescuer and a haven. And indeed, part of the exhibition tells the story of the long journey from the old world of displaced persons camps and anti-Semitism to American egalitarianism for, uh, uh, for victims. And there's a bit of a parallel here to Israeli narratives in the sense that now America is portrayed as the land, the land of refuge and of freedom. Um, secondly, the second motivation for memorialization is America's failure to respond at the time. But that leads directly into the third. Why is it important to remember that? Because now America is a superpower that can prevent genocide from recurring. This is the story of America as the egalitarian power concerned with human rights that can really implement that important uh, injunction never again. So in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and we see this in many other museums, the main themes of memorialization, it seems to me, are American ideals, ideals of liberty, of pluralism and immigration. So it's preserving not just the memory of the Holocaust, but also American democratic ideals. And by remembering crimes that happened somewhere else encourages Americans to remember their nation's own idealized reasons for being. Um, and the larger point of these examples, again, is to point to the mediated ways in which the story of the past gets told. And to emphasize, again, this is not a matter of judgment. It's not that it's bad or good. Um, it's inevitable that it will be crafted in particular ways. But what's interesting to do is to step back and, and um, untangle the relationship between history and the way in which it's narrated in the present. It's not a neutral act. I think I'm going to stop there with my comments um, and pass over to Jonathan um, to talk about some related questions in the South African context.
Thank you, Shelley, and thank you for, wow, that was an amazing lecture. Um, you sure we don't have to pay for that? I mean, <laughs> that was really, really uh, uh, um, just so incredibly fortifying and, and, and I learned so much. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Tally, for drawing me in again, as you uh, uh, tend to do. I, I am always honored to, to be associated with and, and join platforms of the Johannesburg Holocaust and, and Genocide uh, Center. And, and welcome to all of the participants, and in particular, uh, a, a really warm welcome from my side to survivors, survivors of the, the Holocaust, survivors of the Rwandan genocide, uh, and survivors of any other atrocities uh, um, in the world. Um, one of the reasons I just wanted to mention survivors is that Twitter went crazy today because a white South African man uh, uh, presents himself as an apartheid survivor in uh, New Zealand, where he is running, believe it or not, on an anti-immigrant ticket. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So here's the trivialization of what it means to be a survivor uh, um, uh, 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 with this, uh, uh, this white immigrant running on a nationalist ticket. Um, this is serious stuff uh, for those of you who have survived um, uh, these, these terrible uh, events. So what I thought I would, oh, let me just say this again. Um, uh, uh, there's two Chaya Hermans on, on the screen in front of me. One is not Chaya Herman. I think it's uh, one of our close friends, Vani uh, Pele. But Chaya Herman a long time ago gave me a book, uh, a, a dissertation rather, uh, on, on music and the Holocaust. Uh, uh, it, it was one of the most amazing books I've ever read. And, um, and, and, it's such a privilege to be with the author, with Shelley uh, uh, Gilbert uh, uh, in, in that context. Okay, so one of the things that, 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 that you know, uh, puzzles me uh, about my own country, about uh, South Africa, is the, um, uh, is, is our obsession at times with, uh, with memorials in the form of physical buildings, stone statues, uh, and stuff like that, and 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 I want to start a discussion, a reflection on how South Africans responded, particularly since 2015, to to some of these attempts to <laughs> deal with our our past in memorial in the form of memorials, uh, uh, with a, a quote that I love. Uh, by an Austrian writer called Robert Musel, who says there is nothing in the world so invisible as a monument. <laughs> now, this certainly struck me in the context of um, the bronze uh, statue of Cecil John Rhodes on the campus of UCT, uh, created in 1934, moved uh, onto the upper campus uh, in the 1960s. And, and even though I was never a UCT student, I used to visit the campus often for various reasons. And of course, you, you, you were aware of this uh, uh, huge uh, you know, bronze statue, but you were also not aware, you're not conscious of it. You walk around it, you, it's just there uh, uh, in, in, in such a, and suddenly uh, a student activist uh, 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 you know, throws human excrement on it and it, it sets off. Uh, one of the most violent, in probably the most violent episode in the history of higher education in South Africa, uh, about a century of history, uh, uh, in, in, in calls for the decolonization of uh, our universities. And what intrigues me is why that particular statue became such an obsession uh, 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 the vice chancellor tried to move it around the campus. The Senate, in a remarkable bout of consciousness, <laughs> with one abstention, or, uh, uh, decided to to remove it from the campus, and that that intrigues me. 
uh, how did this thing suddenly become such an uh, a, 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 you know focus of attention and session uh, in 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 South South Africa, and almost immediately in the weeks that followed, um, there was the attack on anything resembling a statue, whether you knew the meaning of it or not. So, for example, the horse memorials, um, you know, uh, recognizing the role of horses, for example, in, in, in the war, in the Great War, uh, uh, get attacked in places like Newton Egg and, and Port Elizabeth in the Eastern Cape. There is the attack on and the defacement of King George's uh, bust in, on the campus of the University of KwaZulu Natal. But there's also the attack on the statue of Mahatma Gandhi uh, in Johannesburg. And there is the attack on a beautiful piece of artwork on the campus where I was uh, vice chancellor at the time uh, called the Bull Rider that was uh, produced by a black artist, by the way, and a progressive artist. And, and that thing comes under, in fact, I was there at that time uh, and I'll tell you a little anecdote about that. When I saw a, a, a non-student, a uh, former student of the university, sort of chipping away at the bull ride, <laughs> and I tried to engage him in conversation uh, at night, but he ran away. Um, so I, I was really fascinated. How do you get both the bull rider and Mahatma Gandhi coming under attack, even as you get Paul Kruger's statue in Pretoria? Central and um, uh, and King George uh, coming under attack uh, uh, at the same uh, time. And so I want to share with you a few ideas uh, about what happens in South Africa when these invisible uh, things become spectacularly visible uh, and is met with very, very violent uh, actions. And I, for the sake of time, I, I normally go with seven or 10 things as higher and many will know, but I'm going to, for the sake of time, just reduce it to five uh, theses around um, uh, what I think the way South Africa deals with, uh, with these visible memories of a very present uh, past. And, and the first, uh, a thesis I want to share with you is that the attack on the roads and indeed the attack on almost any statue is often a proxy for very, very deep discontents in the in post-apartheid society. So if you saw the attack on the roads as having to do with roads, I don't think so. Um, uh, it just happened to be there. It just happened to be visibly there. Um, but uh, as I said, for decades, it troubled no one. Uh, other, including in a beautiful reflection on it, uh, uh, a former PCG student called Albie Sachs. But um, the, 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 I, I don't know of a, a more appropriate word uh, in the English language for hurtful. I think people were genuinely students, young people were just hurtful with the fact that you have this corrupt government that had uh, gone off the rails, that had treated people with contempt, uh, and, 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 and the inequalities were rampant even more so now, by the way, post uh, uh, in the COVID period. And, and so the attack on the statue is actually not about the statue. It is about, on the one hand, what it represents uh, institutionally, um, but more broadly, uh, a, a, a lashing out almost against uh, a promise uh, because of a promise that wasn't kept, the democratic promise of 1994. The second thing, um, uh, the thesis that I want to share is that I think what the physical memorial offers um, is an opportunity for, I, I'm not the first one to use the term, for the politics of spectacle. It's much of South African protest is about spectacle. You don't just protest, you burn tires. You don't just protest, you attack buildings. In fact, in Seneca, in the free state where I lived for seven years, uh, it was the oddest thing for me to see white farmers who were also cut for, you know, uh, turning over a police van, burning it, 
uh, and and you know uh, and, and attacking policemen. This is highly unusual in that community. But the spectacle, the fact that you know by burning things, by uh, you know, and our campuses, by the way, as a result of two years of this kind of spectacle. Uh, uh, the, the, the damage uh, ran north of, of 900,000 rands in South African currency, that's a lot of money, and, and, and so on. And it is as if there is something that is unleashed that sees this public spectacle, which, is now, which now travels in real time via social media of all kinds to the different media houses, uh, that, uh, that this lies at the heart of this kind of politics in, in South Africa that, um, that partly explains the attack on statues. I'm just finishing a book um, looking at, the, at what happened to decolonization over a period of five years on 10 campuses uh, from the point of view of the politics of knowledge. And one of the things that really fascinated me was the, how upset students were at the University of the Western Cape which was historically, is historically a black university. And when roads came down, the student activists were very upset that they had nothing to tear down. <laughs> so of course, it wasn't, it wasn't an old English colonial you know, university or university with colonial pretensions, such as UCT and, 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 and Wits and the old University of Natal. Uh, but the part of the spectacle very much uh, explains all this. The third thesis I want to share with you is that um, the indiscriminate nature of the, the, the spectacular takedowns of, of, of memorials reflects not only um, uh, you know, a very gross political ignorance in, in my view, but also the fatal disconnect between politics and pedagogy uh, in the heat of the moment. In other words, don't you even try and we did try, I can assure you, to sort of say, how can we repurpose some of these memorials instead of just taking down a figure that I don't think uh, on, on the campus I, I, I served uh, at, you know, I couldn't see the point of taking down Stain's statue. Stain was a World War general. He, he's not for Wood, if you know what I mean. He's not Malani. He's not Swartz. He is a guy uh, around the turn of the previous century, who's, who's got some anti-imperial, anti-English uh, sentiment and with his people, as he would have uh, passed the circle, uh, decides to stand up against uh, empire. So I said, instead of taking down this huge statue of um, uh, 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 President Stein, why don't we put him in conversation with another statue? And that is of a, of a great leader from that area called King Musheshwe, and have them stand across each other at the same height and, and, and engage them in some kind of dialogue about history. I, you know, I tried to raise that possibility with several generations of, of student leaders. There was no appetite. For the same reason that I said when we renamed the, the law school building, I tried to say, let's rename it, you know after Judge Ismail Mohammed, who could defend his clients, uh, 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 his black clients under the apartheid uh, uh, in the Court of Appeals. But he had to drive all the way from Bloemfontein to Kimberley uh, <laughs> in another part of, of Central South Africa because he's an Indian South African. So, you know, this is an amazing guy. Uh, let's, uh, but there was no, there was no, there is no, um, uh, possibility of that kind of dialogue because there's no place for education, there's no place for learning, there's no place, it's either you bring it down, you chop it down, you burn it up, and so on and so forth. And that for me as an education person is an extremely dangerous thing, uh, regardless of the politics and the heat uh, of, of the moment, uh, to not be able to think, especially in a university. Uh, you know, if a university is anything, it is a place where you take another look. It is a place even if you're upset, in which reason triumphs over age. It is a place in which you insist on the discipline, and I use the word deliberately, of, of learning, uh, instead of just tearing down things. But try and have that conversation, uh, uh, having that conversation in 2015, 16. So it is, as I said, as I said a fatal disconnect here. 
between politics and pedagogy. Number four, um, related to the previous point, is my thesis that when the replacement of memorials come up, it is often in South Africa very narrow, nativist, nationalistic, sometimes tribal sentiments that drive the replacement thinking. In other words, you cannot have a conversation about abroad. I mean, you just take, take uh, you would imagine in a place like Cape Town, apart from the old slave museum, there would be very prominent attention to slave memorials or to the naming of streets, airports, whatever you wish, after prominent slave uh, and slaves in the early history of the Cape. Try and have that conversation in an African nationalist context where what it means to be African and, and, and uh, nothing, nothing irritates me more. Uh, there was a teacher in, in a place called Oatson this week who was <laughs> in the South African color scheme. Uh, he would have been classified as colored and he was accused of fraud by the Department of Education for presenting himself in the interview as an African. <laughs> this is the guy who had the temerity to think of himself broadly as an African, as opposed to somebody that must be remembered by its apartheid nickname. This is the dark side of, of these debates. And so I've never been caught up in the allegedly progressive sentiments that lie behind decolonization, as important as decolonization, as I just told, the um, uh, the Association of Commonwealth Universities this morning, uh, I, I really do believe there's unfinished business with respect to decolonization. But when all of that gets drawn down to a very ethno-nationalist sense, as Adam Abib calls it, of what it means you know, to replace things, then of course you're in trouble. Uh, and, and, and number five, I want to suggest um, that the politics of memory in South Africa, and particularly in relation to memorials broadly defined, as Shirley very usefully put it in her opening remarks, is not only highly selective, but very contradictory in what it wants to achieve. And let me give you two examples. When roads came down and top was toppled at UCT, you didn't need to be very smart to realize that the next candidate for toppling was Rhodes University, right? And because it's named after the dude, okay? And Rhodes University went through an incredible angst, you know, and it went to the leadership of the university, to the Senate, the council, and ultimately, and the, the alumni and so on. Ultimately, despite the very, very intense and very often violent, um, uh, 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 decolonial protest movement at uh, the Grahamstown uh, University campus. Um, just like that, they decided, no, we need to keep the name of Rhodes because of its brand value. Now, maybe I'm too simple to understand these things, but for me, there is something called principle. If the principle at stake is that this is not tolerable to have the memory of Rhodes so prominent at UCT and everybody, most of the 26 public universities took to the streets to demand that, then why the hell does the name Rhodes, why do you make that kind of, you know? And I remember uh, somebody from uh, a book that my colleague Crane Sardine very usefully calls the Cape Radicals. It's a tradition we forget about in the Cape, uh, not these nationalists. Um, of, of either uh, you um, uh, would say to the ruling party, just tell me what you stand for and what do you fall for? And, 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 and that's very much the dilemma here is when you don't have a principled position on these kinds of things, you pick and choose uh, according to what is convenient, even in the same time period, et cetera. Let me take another example, absolute hypocrisy, which is the road scholarship, okay? And some of these students at the head of the decolonial movement were the same students, okay, pleading to be funded, to be able to study under the Rhodes Scholarship. And I have a very specific example from of that with Adam Abib, uh, to be able to study uh, at Oxford. It doesn't make any sense to me, okay? If it is a principal position, then you take it. 
uh, and, 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 and act consistently. So, uh, um, how does this show up in the present? I just want to use one example very quick, uh, quickly. Uh, um, a few weeks ago, some of you might know, there was this huge debacle in the South African media around a, a you know, a retail store called Clicks. And Clicks in its marketing campaign advertised hair straightening products. And in the process, juxtaposed the hair of, of, of black women as <laughs> being undesirable and brittle and all that stuff. And then, uh, would you believe it, this beautiful blonde hair that is uh, presented as the I ideal. Now, nine out of 10 in South Africa, that would raise eyebrows and it would pass and everybody would forget it, except the EFF, one of the political parties with a pension for violence um, uh, when an opportunism uh, was in lockdown. And of course, lockdown didn't allow you to routinely disrupt parliament. Here is an ideal way to get attention again. And so they will, they, they announced the military command that you need to show up at these click stores. And of course there's protests, there's several click stores gets rubbish and, and, and so on. And what happens in this sort of very intense and often violent episode of confrontation with clicks? Well, guess what? Um, there's a negotiation, clicks will give scholarships for um, black women to to be able to pursue their studies, and at the same time, <laughs> their strengthening products continue to be sold. That's what I mean when I sort of say the, these spectacular events is, it doesn't have a politics of principle, doesn't have a politics uh, outside of the, 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 the show. And, 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 uh, uh, and I obviously uh, regard that as... Um, difficult for us, particularly in the context of higher education, to have a very different uh, conversation. So again, let me underline, I find, I, I, I would certainly make the case with or without the tragedy of the death of George Floyd, that those Confederate statues needed to come and flags, needed to come down everywhere from Virginia to South Carolina. Uh, of course, it's offensive. You know, these were these are reminders of, of of the period of slavery and for those who fought to to maintain it, particularly in the South of the United States. I definitely would make the argument that there is no place in the center of Bristol for a, a, a memorial to a slave trader. You know, it makes no whatever else he might have done with his life. Uh, those things. But what I don't agree with is that the only response to offensive uh, memorials is making it disappear from the public sphere. Because I really do believe, also in the case, by the way, and yeah, I have to be careful because I'm not an expert on memorialization in the context of, of the Holocaust. But I wonder whether there is a space in thinking about things that break us, you know, uh, whether there's a space in South Africa, for example, for memorialization that also demonstrates social solidarity, that also demonstrates human connection across these divisive minds, that also demonstrates historical complexity. A dear mentor and friend of mine, and Huberman, uh, was a professor at, uh, Lieberman, sorry, he was a professor at Stanford University, uh, in the middle of writing the book, um, Knowledge in the Blood, and comes over to me and says, there's a movie I want you to know, if you know Anne, <laughs> she, <laughs> she's much older than me, and Anne doesn't talk to me, Anne gives me instructions, and Anne says to me, I want you to watch this movie tonight. Okay, and you tell me about it tomorrow. So I watch this movie today. A man, I tell you, there is no other movie that has made me appreciate the complexity of and the entanglement of our lives than I always have to write it down, otherwise I say the German wrong. But the the German name of this movie, one of the greatest movies, I think, uh, Des anderen Leben, uh, or The Lives of Others. 
And what that movie does for me is to make what appears to be in the context of the Stasi, a very clear cut case between uh, perpetrator and victim to begin to see ourselves uh, uh, through the lives of others and recognize not only our own complicity in our human misery, but also uh, uh, invoke in us a compassion that reaches out rather than only condemn. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Janssen, Professor uh, Gilbert. Um, what we will uh, invite you, I will, I will offer some comments um, to, uh, to offer, uh, as, as uh, uh, Shirley asked me to, to discuss a little bit of our thoughts around uh, establishing the Holocaust and Genocide Center and, and uh, bringing together some of those um, comments that you both uh, offered. And I will invite you all to please start uh, writing your questions and comments in the chat. And uh, we will have uh, about 20 minutes or so to, uh, to, to, um, for a discussion and also for our two presenters to ask each other some questions. So um, the, the process of, of creating, of course, the Holocaust and Genocide Center took many, many years. I'm myself, am a, a, a daughter of survivors. I worked also in uh, Rwanda for many years in the last uh, probably 20 years. And when it comes to South Africa, in the continent of Africa, building a memorial or a, a, a education center, a, 80 years or 75 years after the atrocities in Europe, 25, 26 years after the atrocities in Rwanda, the question was, what are we creating? And uh, the, the decision was to create an education center rather than a museum, a place of dialogue like we do tonight, a place where we can ask the questions and the difficult questions that uh, Jonathan you asked, that uh, Shelley you asked, and, uh, and, and actually having an open space looking at case studies of genocide, mass atrocities in the 20th century. And uh, uh, starting, as I said, in Namibia, ending in Rwanda, but speaking about the Rohingya in uh, Myanmar, speaking about the Yazidi in, um, in Iraq and Syria. Uh, we, we do a lot of work on xenophobia, Afrophobia, on gender-based violence, on disabilities. So making the connections, not uh, a, 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 making the connections between memory and today. And um, in that uh, spirit, uh, we were involved first with you, Jonathan, taking 36 student leaders after Rhodes fell, actually. Uh, immediately after Rhodes fell. In uh, uh, November, December 2015, we took 36 student leaders from two campuses in the Free State, Kwakwa campus and, uh, and Bloemfontein campus to Poland and Germany. And then three times more took uh, students and uh, student leaders and other leaders from uh, South Africa and Africa to Poland and Germany from UCT and uh, generally from, from other campuses around South Africa and Africa. And really um, a, a opening a discussion of looking at other, facing other difficult pasts, what can we reflect or how can we reflect on our situations here in South Africa? And the discussions were absolutely amazing. So it's interesting that you said that they, the, the, the discussion at the height of everything was we cannot let even the statues stay when the, the, the students came to, to Poland and Germany and faced some of those uh, memorials that uh, you showed us in Majdanek or in Auschwitz or in Berlin or in the Stasi uh, Museum uh, in Berlin uh, uh, in, uh, um, in, in uh, East, East Berlin. Uh, those were the challenging times to try and think how that relates to what we are doing here in South Africa. What do we do? How do we manage the past? And 
many questions came and, and I'll, I'll just maybe end by, by saying, giving you two examples. One of them was a real uh, look, a honest look within to say, we do, know, not, we do not know our, uh, our memorial sites in South Africa. They asked each other, did you ever visit Constitution Hill? Did you ever go to Lily's Leaf? Did you ever go to Robben Island? And I do not think, I think that there was one or two students that did, but none of the others did. So, so there was a realization that we are going to Poland and Germany to look at colonial past and Holocaust past and so on, but we actually do not even know what we have in our backyard. That was one big discussions that we have or that we had. The other interesting discussion is, look at Germany, they are facing their past. What does it mean they're facing their past? They're democratic now, they're, part, they're facing a past of you know, dictatorship. What past are we facing in South Africa? Are we facing our, uh, you know, uh, do, do, do we look at all history as our history? Are we, uh, I remember a discussion about, uh, um, for example, atrocities in Namibia. Um, no, 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 that was apartheid regime that did atrocities in Namibia. We cannot take it as our history. It's not our history. Yet Germany must face their past. But excuse me, it's a democracy. Why should they, you know, uh, face a, a dicta dictatorial past? So I'm just giving you two of the examples. And there were many rich examples of questions about we are seeing one past in Germany, one other past in Poland. What do we do with our own past? So uh, the questions are starting to come in, but maybe I will allow Shirley, Shirley first ask your one question and maybe Jonathan ask your one questions. And I have uh, now three questions that I will pose to you. Thanks, Tali. Um, and thank you, Jonathan, also for your comments. Lots of lots of um, ideas and and um, rich and provocative questions. So, um, one thing I wanted to ask you: I was really struck in your talk by this paradox between what's visible and what's invisible. You know, this notion on the one hand that there's nothing in the world so invisible as a monument, and on the other hand, having in my mind this very vivid picture of all those students clamored all over roads and pulling him down. You know, it's, it's not invisible at all, although in a way, they're kind of both there at the same time, the visibility and the invisibility in the way you were describing it. So, you know, on the one hand, we have this real heightened anxiety. And I suppose now I'm zooming out of roads must fall. I'm thinking of Black Lives Matter and, and, and other examples when I say we, there's this heightened anxiety about memorials, about representations of the past in the public sphere, but there's actually in, in your telling of it, and I think in many of the examples that we've seen, no actual real engagement with history. Um, there's no education, as you put it, there's no learning, there's no dialogue, there's even a shutting down of dialogue. Um, and so as you were talking, I was thinking, well, you know, can we think of more productive spaces for engagement? Do we, do we have examples? Do you have examples of more productive engagement with the past? And how can one engage publics in more productive encounters with the past? Um, you were talking towards the end of your remarks about a memorialization that would demonstrate social solidarity, that would demonstrate human connection, that would really get the complexity of history. And, you know, it occurred to me that it's, it's actually very difficult to convey those kinds of things or to elicit those kinds of things, especially in stone or in, you know, those are not pliable media. Um, so how do we do try and elicit those kinds of very difficult nuanced things can we actually productively do that through in the public sphere through our public memorialization i'm curious yeah. what your thoughts are no thanks Shirley. and and obviously you know as somebody who who is involved in in education uh, and and teacher education uh, in particular this is something that i i think about all the time the, the one thing that's really clear, you, you cannot do that in any context, certainly um, not in uh, 
in, in a politically flammable you know, situation, you can't raise anything. And, and you're quite right. I mean, you, 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 you take a huge risk to your, to your, your life very often uh, if you had a counter idea. So you've got to do this in peacetime or relative, you know, quiet times. And we did that. So the Stein statue in the annual festival in Bloemfontein, uh, uh, with the help of Australian colleagues, uh, uh, we had the Pink Presidents Project. And there's a beautiful chapter in our book on decolonization by Brenda Shimalman from University of Johannesburg, mm -hmm. uh, with with very vivid images of how we they put this pink plastic. Uh, over all the images in the city uh, of roses uh, that uh, of, of statues of, of um, uh, stain, and that got a lot of discussion going. So there, there were sort of little, you know, audio records built into the statue so that people could come by, and look at this pink thing, sense history as being malleable, and, and pink, of course, in the context of a very masculine and and you know, uh, Calvinist and traditional uh, uh, community uh, did what did its work and so on and so forth and so on the future. Then, of course, as Stanley said, it was very clear to me we needed to raise the money to get our students not to think of their struggles as exceptional, but to see themselves as part of a broader struggle for humanity. And, and Tally did it absolutely as she normally does. Um, a beautiful job of getting the students to think, the student leaders in this case, to think uh, and to come back with assignments and projects in which we teach them to think comparatively. But that you can't do when everybody's out on the streets uh, uh, and so on and so forth. What I do know is if we don't do that, if we don't insist on a politics and a pedagogy that uh, gets our future leaders to engage with what it means to be human through these kinds of uh, exposures, then of course we're in, in serious uh, trouble. So that would be my response. And, and I wonder if you allow me, Kelly, to ask my question to Shirley. Please. Now, Shirley, this is a bit of a difficult question, but um, bear with me as I try to. Uh, uh, Explain it. I want you, I mean, you know, both my children were born in the US. I spent a big part of my growing up intellectually in, in that country. I'm, I'm absolutely devastated by its current uh, leadership uh, and all of that. But one of the things that really, really sh shocked me, you know, was that uh, you might recall the not just the broader rise of the old right, the fact that people can know that things are sayable now about black people, about Jewish people, et cetera, that, that wasn't, you know, previously. Um, and, and in particular, the Charlottesville, Virginia, now I had sort of two emotions looking at that. So here are these young people, okay, uh, marching with slogans like, uh, Jews will not defeat us. And, on the one hand, I don't know what the hell that's about, okay, because of, I don't know who was defeating you. On the other hand, I recognize the hatred, I recognize the anti-Semitism on the one hand, and, 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 and that obviously energized a lot of the decent people, not just the left in, in, in America to speak out against it. But the fact that those groups were now more visible and now more present in the public sphere, often with, you know, uh, not so subtle support from the White House, that scares the hell out of me and that exists. At the same time, I look at those young people, okay, and I say, there's something that went wrong, seriously wrong, in your education to feel so alienated, you know, within your own country, you know, the Trump base, and I don't want to confuse these two uh, communities, but you know what I'm saying. And, 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 and I do feel that the Democrats in that context really did neglect the white working class, really did contribute to some extent, you know, you think of the destruction of the labor unions and all of that, that you then had this group of alienated people who then express themselves, you know, uh, in ways that, um, uh, 
that are offensive, but often conceal a deeper distress uh, about their uh, social and economic alienation. I want to ask you, Shirley, is it possible to have those two conversations at the same time? Jonathan, I'm not sure, sorry if I missed something, but so what are the two conversations? The one conversation you... on the one hand about this racism and anti-Semitism mm -hmm. and, and horrific stuff, and at mm -hmm. the same time looking at these as young people mm -hmm. who for some reason feel alienated from their own country, from their own, you know, mm. economy, from their own, you know, a sense of, of, mm. of, of, of hope. And I'm not suggesting at all that these things enjoy any equivalence, you know, in, mm. in, in, in any sense. But it does seem to me you, you're not going to solve the one thing without at least being able to engage the other. Mm. I mean, I suppose why, why the question confused me is because I don't see them as two separate conversations or as unrelated phenomena. I mean, I think if one looks at the history of, um, if one is looking specifically as anti-Semitism, but I'm sure that there are, um, you know, if one looks at the larger histories of racisms, uh, one can find similar things, but anti-Semitism erupts, uh, sometimes anti-Semitism erupts in a group that feels disenfranchised, um, that feels um, afraid, or that feels um, kind of, that, that feels that the, the, the changes that are happening around it, that it is being left behind. So that the slogan was actually not Jews will not defeat us, it was Jews will not replace us. It's this notion Jews. of white genocide that, you know, Jews are, are somehow going to replace um, the, you know, the white civilization. Um, to me, I don't see a contradiction between them. It seems, uh, if not obvious and inevitable, it seems not surprising to me that a group that feels, um, I, I keep coming back to the word disenfranchised, I'm not sure that it's the right word, but that feels alienated, that feels disgruntled, that feels disempowered, would turn to Jews because there's, you know, the the, um, Jewish, the trope of the the powerful Jew who controls everything, who controls the media, who controls society, who controls politics. Well, you know, if something's going wrong, then the Jew must be behind it. The Jew must be the one who has the power, who's going to, you know, replace us or remove us or whatever it is. Um, so I'm not sure I totally understood your question, but if I did, it seems to me that they're inseparably interlinked. Yeah, no, I think I think you I think you did answer that. Yeah. All right. So there are lots of questions. We'll try to go uh, through as many as possible. And Jonathan, maybe I'll start with two that are inter interlinked and, and related. One is from uh, Harry Snyman that is saying, will a memorial for, for reconciliation after apartheid funded by white people, for example, be of any significance? Or is it uh, the a juxtaposition of a full trek monument with a apartheid museum side by side almost, you know, one in Johannesburg, one in Pretoria, um, a, you know, be some kind of a, of a way to go, where you go to both and you engage with both. And a, a related question from uh, Theo Jen, a, a Niwan Shuti, that is saying, um, can the classroom also become a healing space? So when we look at places of reconciliation and healing uh, and not just a learning space, uh, and if yes, what needs to be uh, in place to enable a safe yet critical and transformative engagement with such histories, memories, and heritage that hurts? Sure, so let me go to the first one. Um, the, uh, by the way, this is something I did when I was a dean at the University of Pretoria. It caused quite a consternation. I sent the students in one academic year to the Apartheid Museum and the Fort Fuertrecker Monument on the same day. <laughs> I, I think the lecturer, uh, uh, my colleague, had to change her entire teaching plan because, you know, the white Afrikaans-speaking students uh, 
I had never been to the apartheid museum, and the black students had never been to the Fuertreka monument. And because she was very skilled, um, uh, and I helped her teach that class, we could get a conversation uh, going about, you know, um, what Eva Hoffman so beautifully called, you know, this clash of martyrological memories, you know, when, when everybody thought they were victim on both sides of, of the uh, equation. So I think that uh, needs to happen, but it sort of leads to the second part. There is a naivete that you can simply put content into the curriculum and be able to deal with complex issues such as healing and reconciliation and so on and so forth. Most South African teachers, as I know them, are, are, will have great difficulty because, you know, my understanding of teaching uh, these difficult uh, 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 concepts is that you can't do it unless you have had a conversation with yourself in the first place. You know, you can't presume to transform others unless you've transformed yourself. You cannot. I mean, can you imagine a conservative teacher in the nor rural Northwest in, in a traditional white school trying to take on issues in a school that is 95% white and Afrikaans, or in these English elite schools in the southern suburbs, you know, uh, uh, where the fees are north of 100,000 rand, having a conversation about social justice, give me a break. You know, I mean, so it, it's, it, I mean, a big part of the difficulty here is how you prepare teachers to be able to do this. And I, because you're not just dealing here with technical skills, you're dealing here with social understandings, with emotions, with people's personal biographies, all intruding into the curriculum conversation. And then finally, I, I you know, I think, We've come, it's now more than 25 years, and it's very, very difficult in South Africa to have a conversation today. This was dif different in 1994, okay, or in the early 90s, when Nelson Mandela could walk onto, you know, a, um, uh, uh, a rugby stadium and people went crazy, or you could visit Tani Betsy Favurik in Orania, or you could, you know, have tea with a guy, the prosecutor, Percy uh, Utah. This is very different today. It is very different to have a memorial or memorialization of reconciliation unless you simultaneously have uh, the conversation around social justice. I see the two, by the way, as, 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 um, as connected uh, and so on. Otherwise, you do have what the theologian, uh, late theologian at UNISA, um, uh, called cheap reconciliation. You know, you want a reconciliation. Take the Seneca. In Seneca, they, you, you cannot talk. We need to talk about reconciliation in Seneca, make no mistake. But you have to link it to the land question. Otherwise, this conversation goes nowhere. Thank you. Thank you. So, Shirley, now maybe two questions to you that I'll try to connect. Peter Houston um, is, is saying that, um, uh, that you mentioned that the public view of memory of the past does not mainly come from professional historians, but from a variety of social sources. Also, that memory is not a neutral process. Social media, uh, for example, looms large with Holocaust denialism and uh, inappropriate forms of memory being fashioned according to present social needs. You remember the uh, memorial in Berlin and all the, the posing there that he's speaking about of selfies in death camps. What impact has the selfie generation and the TikTok teenagers had on Holocaust memory and mem memorialization? And maybe I'll connect to Claire Walford's uh, question that societies, they change over time. You know, so, so Peter is speaking about the, the, the society now with social media, but Clay is saying things are, uh, you know, changing all the time. So should we build mon monuments, expecting them to last for hundreds of years or just a couple of generations? Or how do we change that, you know, that, that memorialization uh, language? Mm. Thank you, Peter and Claire. Um, so, Peter's question is an interesting one, and I think I would probably answer it by saying that social media is 
you know, social media is a form that perhaps makes these conversations or the, let me reel back. It seems to me that the challenge at the moment, and this is within the global political climate, is what it is increasingly possible to say. So the kind of anti-Semitism, the kind of Holocaust denialism that we see in the public sphere is not something that we were seeing even five or 10 years ago. Um, I don't think that that is a cause of social media, but I think social media is one of the forms that allows that kind of conversation to happen very quickly and easily for it to be um, perhaps more emotive um, than it might be in other fora, um, for people to get very angry and exercised about it, for people to hide behind a kind of anonymity. Um, so I think it's maybe exacerbating um, what the political climate is already enabling. Um, and I agree with you that it's, it's worrying how one tackles it is a different question. Um, I mean, Claire's question is a, is a bigger and more difficult one. And it really goes to the much larger underlying question of what are memorials for and what do we hope from them? You know, if, if, we, if we take the view as Jonathan was saying at the beginning of his talk uh, with his quote, um, that there is nothing so invisible as a memorial, then perhaps, you know, memorials are there so that mayors or governments or whoever it is can, can put up their little statue and say, this proves that I am X or that I believe Y or that I support Z. Um, but if we want them to genuinely function as spaces for public engagement with history, um, then perhaps we need to think about them in different ways if we want them to last for hundreds of years. Um, but then that raises the question that I raised with Jonathan earlier about the form that it takes. I think it's very difficult for a bronze statue or a stone memorial to function in that kind of nuanced way. Maybe we need to think about um, new processes to surround how we more memorialize in the public sphere. I mean, one of the commentators that I heard speaking around the whole uh, when the statue of Colston was tipped into Bristol Harbor um, a few months ago um, was saying, you know, well, maybe we should have public discussions about when memorials go up, you know, so the whole, the, the local public can have a conversation. Should it go up? Shouldn't it? You know, what are, what are we actually memorializing in the public sphere? Involve the public that it becomes a conversation. The chances of that happening, I think, are really slim. But, you know, maybe we need to think more creatively about if, if we want to put memorials into the public sphere in order to function in a particular way, in other words, not to function as things that we just walk past or sit on when we're having our lunch, um, then we need to think more creatively about what are they, what form do they take, and how do we put them out there? So um, Linda Heckner fully agree with you, and she's basically talking uh, about small doses of, of memory uh, that is happening all the time in the land. You can read some of her comments um, in, uh, in the chat. The final question to you, uh, Shirley, and to Jonathan is from uh, our friend Chaya Herman. And, um, and she is sharing her struggles and she's saying, I'm consistently ambivalent about the question of whether we keep statues and physical reminders that were designed to Co uh, consent, uh, concret concretize sorry, an aberrant time in the public eye. I don't want to see them, but nor do I want to ob obliterate them. Uh, they, they sort of need to be there. They need to be there in history. When do we remove the visibility of offensive physical reminders? And when do you use them to display the oppression we have overcome? Who makes that decision and how? So uh, that was actually Vini, not Chaya, but it was, she's, she's signed as Chaya. So uh, Vini, uh, Vini's question, just to, to close our discussion. So Shirley, do you want to start, uh, Shirley, and then maybe sure. Jonathan? Sure, I can start. And actually, I would just first maybe address Linda's point. Um, she mentions in the, the chat the Stolpersteine, but actually, um, so the Stolpersteine, for those of you who don't know, are these small, I guess they're made of bronze. I don't even know what they're made of, plaques um, that are put in the pavement. Um, it's a project that was begun by an artist in Germany outside the homes where Jewish victims of the Nazis used to live. Um, and it literally means stumbling stones. 
and the idea is that as you're walking through the street, going about your daily business, going to work or whatever it is, you stumble across a plaque that reminds you that a Jewish victim used to live here. And it's one way of jolting um, memory in the present in a kind of more nuanced way. The other example I, I wanted to mention, Linda, that occurred to me from your comments before that is that there are there are a, a number of counter what are called counter monuments in Germany, or what some scholars have called counter monuments, um, that attempt to to jolt a different kind of remembering. One of them, um, as you walk along the pavements of a street uh, in a in a particular suburb of Berlin, sets off a, a kind of um, projection. So it's something that that is set off by your presence. And again, you know, is it attempting to to take you out of where you are so that you don't just walk past it, but but actually jolt a kind of memory. So those are some creative ideas that have been come up with. Um, to go to Vinny's um, question, um, I suppose these are questions. I'm not sure it's really possible to answer them. And maybe, you know, the best answer is to say um, that decisions about particular memorials, monuments, whatever you want to call them, always, I think, need to be made locally. It's not something we can kind of come up with a blanket policy about. But in order to uh, go through those local decision making processes and thinking about these things, we need to be aware of those questions. Who is <coughs> making those decisions? Why was that statue of Edward Colston put up there in the first place? Who came up with the money? I mean, often this is about funders who have enough money, who have an you know, agenda or, or a, a thing that they're excited about that they want to put in the public realm. Who decides what goes up? Who decides what comes down? To be aware of the dynamic processes that go into putting into the public, putting history into the public sphere. Those are the kind of questions that I outlined right at the beginning. Um, and that with that awareness of the mediated nature of these memorials, then comes an ability to maybe think in more nuanced ways about what do we do with them. In some contexts, maybe it's appropriate to have a plaque beside an offensive statue that encourages people to think about why was this put up in the first place and maybe Maybe that gets people thinking about the past in more nuanced ways. Maybe in some circumstances, it's not possible to do that. The thing just needs to be taken down altogether or it needs to be put in a museum, um, you know, with a plaque next to it, an explanatory plaque next to it. Um, so that, that I think is, is my best answer is, is to be armed with the best critical questions to enable a nuanced decision-making process. <laughs> Jonathan? Yeah, um, uh, thanks for the question, uh, Vinny. I, I, I also am ambivalent about statues because I think South Africa overdid it, particularly when it comes to political figures. So I was so pleased because that's the only kind of statue that makes headlines in South Africa. You know, another, I'm sure Nelson Mandela would say, not another statue, please, or Oliver Tambo, or, you know, etc. And again, you know, there's a selective tradition here to, uh, as Shirley might put it, you know, you're less likely to see Robert Sibukwe <laughs> from the PAC than you are, you know, going to see somebody from the ruling party and so on. I was so delighted when I saw uh, uh, shortly after death a statue being planned that might even have gone up for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, the Supreme Court Justice. And the people who have achieved in the history of South Africa are not just, by gosh, in fact, I don't think politicians achieve much, you know. Um, but where are our architects? Where are our poets? Where are our jazz musicians? Where are our teachers? You know, so if you're going to remember, you know, uh, people from the past who have influenced our uh, uh, um, our country and its, its trajectory, I would want to move very quickly from and then deal with the issues that are relatively simple to deal with. For example, I cannot understand why on the grounds of our parliament in Cape Town is a huge statue of a guy on a horse. This is Louis Boerta, the union uh, prime minister from 1910. Why? Okay, I don't get it. it. I don't know what the value of that the thing is. But but I also don't suggest you just go around and tear it down because it's a buerta. You know, there must be something deeper in the reflection on why we do these things and so on. Ultimately, for me, 
the most power symbol, most powerful symbol or symbolic memory is actually the curriculum, is actually what we teach, uh, you know, um, uh, our children, our young people uh, uh, about the past and, and in the process about the future. And, and how we model that as, as teachers, as public actors, as, as, uh, is, is so much more important than simply, you know, carving out yet another um, piece of stone. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for these, uh, for these uh, uh, comments and, and, and answers. And uh, that's the reason we did two part series because there is so much to speak about when you come to memory. And that's the reason we invite you all next week to continue with Professor Shirley Gilbert. And with uh, next week, uh, joining us will be uh, Freddie Mutangua is actually with us also tonight. Uh, and, and, and he attended this session as well. Freddie, he's a survivor of the uh, Jonathan New Rwanda, but very much of an activist that the, uh, was, uh, a, a, that is a director of the Kigali Genocide Memorial of Aegis Trust, uh, of the Survivors Association uh, in Rwanda and, and a human rights activist. And it will be really interesting to again, discuss uh, the Holocaust, Rwanda and South Africa next week all uh, all together so first of all thank you uh Shelley gilbert thank you jonathan jansen for your uh, fantastic uh, contribution uh tonight thank you to all those that made this possible the team at the johannesburg holocaust and genocide center the sir martin gilbert uh, learning center the university college london uh, aegis trust and rosa luxemburg foundation uh, for all that. And maybe just final word, Shirley, I know that you are offering other courses. Maybe you would like to say final word from you and Jonathan before we close tonight and we say goodnight to, to everyone. Oh, just thank you again to you, Tali, for organizing. Thank you so much, Jonathan, um, for giving off your time to speak tonight. Thank you, Freddie, for next week. I'm so looking forward to it. Um, and just another little plug, which I already put in the chat, please do check out our programs at the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Center. Um, I have a new evening group that's starting in November for those of you who might be interested, and we have lots of other interesting talks and so on. Thank you for coming. And thank you too from, from my side. Kelly, I don't think, uh, uh, I'm going to lay a complaint with your marketing department because I really think every South African should know about this. Uh, I'm going to certainly advertise the remaining uh, events, it is so timely, you know, uh, and, and so important uh, for us to have these difficult conversations. And thank you for setting it up with, with amazing people. Uh, and much, I, I really enjoyed this evening. Thank you. Well, you're very, very welcome. We have a YouTube channel. All the talks are on our YouTube channel. And uh, um, please send this uh, recording to all those that you think should have been here tonight and uh, hopefully we'll be here next week to continue the discussion. Good night, everyone. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, and we will continue the discussion, of course, in the weeks to come. Goodbye.